Hello, WWE Universe, and we are back. I'm sorry, I apologize. Welcome back to another AEW, um, Friday Night Smackdown review at the uh, Stim Thunderdome, or at least an arena that looks at least more watchable than actually doing a weekly primetime shows in a performance center for the last, like, six months. But here we are. Roman Reigns returned to SmackDown since, uh, I think, late March of 2020. Another match involving Big E for his, mid for his uh, singles push. And another open challenge for the IC Championship. Like, that's the premier selling point of the show. We forgot that uh, Otis is still Money in the Bank winner. Like, they still got in these low-tier, but top mid-card feuds for no reason. And the only interest was just to see what would Roman Reigns do for the show. Because, literally, he's the only top draw on SmackDown. That's my opinion, and I'll stick by it until Roman Reigns does something that will get him, like, Corbin heat. Because Corbin is a perennial jobber that looks like a cancer patient. Braun Strowman now looks like a cancer patient. He looks like an overgrown Tommaso Ciampa with no growth of character other than he's doing ha ha ha. And he got overshadowed by a guy that actually uh, has a look that looks appealing, looks like a top guy, and he's just more interesting. Like, there's no marquee match. Other than that one time he had with Brock Lesnar, that made him feel like this is his spot. Roman Reigns made sure that he got a peel. If it wasn't for Roman Reigns, Braun wouldn't be getting the actual fan appeal that he got. Other than that several months of him jobbing out cruiserweights. And the Fiend been underutilized since October of 2019. So, no one cares about a fat slobbering sticking his tongue out in a mask. Jobber. That's going to be coming around doing the same sort of motifs and style that the original Bray Wyatt did. Other than he's doing a, a, like a split personality gimmick. And you get no parental reaction. What do you think if the fans were there and you see Roman Reigns coming back, back in the main event scene in a triple threat match. But Paul Heyman's now his manager. How is that not stirring up any other detail? And you have this fat piece of afterbirth called Wrestling Otaku. If that doesn't make a certain person cringe, then I don't know what will. This guy comes around complaining that he doesn't get girls. He comes around making hentai reviews. Sure, I'm not a certain ladies man myself, but I'm self-aware in the stuff I do. Women don't mind if you're a nerd. But if you're that much of a cringe fest wearing the same t-shirts 24-7, you come around looking fat, sloppy, wearing sunglasses all the time, it looks like you don't lose weight and you complain about women 24-7, you always talk about uh, sweaty midget men wearing wrestling, wearing wrestling fed merch of a fed barely a lot of people know of, getting like below millions of viewers since the, their first freaking two episodes. There's something completely wrong with you. So that was it. Jeff Hardy had an open challenge against Shinsuke Nakamura for the Intercontinental Championship, but somehow AJ Styles not medically cleared to come back to compete for some apparent reason. The match was overbearingly, stretchably long. I mean, the best part of the match was that running slingshot below the rope German suplex, a couple enziguries. The same thing with the selling factor still going over to the knee because they did go into. Styles attacking it, uh, attacking the back of the knee, back in their brawl with Retribution. He did push off Styles, and he didn't even wasn't affecting to the match. He was still complaining, gibbering him off. He was like, Are you using the illegal weapon, losing the illegal weapon. You were that getting upset over losing the Intercontinental Championship when you were a two-time WWE Champion. Are you serious? Shinsuke lost at the Swanton Bomb. We also had this mini vignette with Shizaro complaining, What did he tell me he was going? It was an open challenge. How are you not aware? What did you call me, even though we're in the same building? It was it was an awkward segment. I don't even know why they put Cesaro if he wasn't going to be a major factor into the match until later on after a post. 
after it looks like Styles is about to say some stuff, uh, scoring him over the IC Championship. Sami Zayn came out of nowhere with his hair looking longer, more of him looking like a skinny, scrawny, fat, uh, skinny, fat jobber, with his beard still looking big and his hair being long, even though he hasn't been on TV for the last, like, five months. And he comes around just big booting him and then hardly no selling, even though that's technically the halluva kick. And my brother just said a hell of a kick. I was about to slap the shit out of him. But that was a... Uh, that was this opening segment. No retribution. Thank the Lord. Thank it. Thank, thank him. Thank the Lord Scott Steiner. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was the opening segment. We also had Chad Gable against Matt Riddle. The, the match ended as quick as possible. And we all had the expansive moveset of a former silver medalist, I think he was. An Olympian, an undersized underdog that is beyond the haters, still doing like 27 German suplexes with no storytelling, losing to a bicycle kick, and I think an exploder suplex. I think he still lost to some kind of sleeper hold. Either way, Riddle lost with the thing being Corbin challenging him at payback with a lackluster build to a one-week pay-per-view after just the biggest pay-per-view of the year. Uh, there was only one, there was only, like, one opinion that I agreed in that wrestling otaku thing. He also did some dumb takes. He coming around saying the N-word in a freaking video about him being unemployed. And he comes around saying that WWE is worse than AEW. Just dropped it. I'd rather watch 205 Live than Dark. And, and they kept trying to, trying to build up this feud over Matt Riddle. Like... I was like, oh, Chad Cable doesn't know who he is anymore. How how to build up this character than him losing every week? The build up to this is uncanny. They've been teasing over the factor. They could have just had this on the kickoff show, or at least try to have a blow off match on SmackDown, because no one cares about obviously the predictability factor over Corbin's King's Ransom. Probably like Robert, no Robert Roode's on SmackDown now. So I mean Raw now because of the trade. But, uh, probably someone's gonna make a return to do the King's Ransom, because, of course, that's gonna play a factor. And, of course, we can't have a bounty storyline, I mean, feud, because there's no story in this. Other than, Corbin wants him out of SmackDown. Not because he's getting more attention, or he's getting more hype. He just wants him out of SmackDown, even though he's been on NXT. I don't get this factor. He's just an overgrown jobber with the most prestigious tournament win. I don't get it. I'm not enticed to watch this match, other than Riddle kneeing the hell out of this guy. Because at least Riddle's captivating. He has a cool, conductive personality. He's he's just Van Damme with Aleister Black's move set, But he's cool, and he looks charismatic. And he seems to talk a lot of shit. I don't mind Matt Riddle. I just hope he's just in more important feuds that make him more interesting. Next up, we have the golden role models that were even before their promo. Hyping, hyping the factor of... Uh, their pay-per-view match out of the somehow automatically dislikable factor of the most ugliest bitches you'll ever see. I'm sorry. The most ugliest women you'll ever see on pay-per-view for a women's tag team title match. Of course, there's doubts in the air. They come around talking to Heavy Machinery and Big E because they were in a six-man tag match with uh, Miz and Morrison and some other jobber. Uh... Yeah, they come around just saying, oh, you want to see a couple guys play with their meat? Yeah, what about you come around, you know, staying in your lane, Biggie, with the tax traps? Bailey, get released. Get, go back to NXT. You have no personality. Other than you being cocky, ugly, horse-faced, female jobber, always beating Nikki Cross for some apparent reason, with, with a lackluster women's division. This is so terrible. And they're selling the factoid of Bailey actually breaking up with Sasha Banks. Like, I'm enticed to watch that. She even brought up the factoid that Sasha has a not a good reputation defending her Raw Women's title. Then they have her... Then we had, uh, as soon as it looked like they were having doubts, Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax being like, We hate each other, but if we hate both of you guys. So that obviously means I'll tag with anyone, even the person that cost me a match against the, world, the women's champion. Her, with her freaking eyeshadow looking like soot that she got punched in the eye by an abusive husband. Looking like a, one of the pets, if they had a bad sex change gone wrong, they just have to stick with it. 
Shayna Baszler looks like Aleister Black turned transgender. Nia Jax looks even worse. She's supposed to be this irresistible force. She comes around looking like Wendy Williams uh, with supporting plus plus size women. It, it, in the promo, just looks so mediocre over the fact for, the fact of this mismatch pair. Even though Nia Jax literally cost her a match against the women that they're already feuding with from just a few days ago. So I already know this is probably, they're probably going to win up some kind of dumb conclusion. I don't care in the fact that who wins or loses. Those are for people who waste their time doing prediction videos for already peop for a show that's already at the ones of millions of viewers. Oh boy, we had Drew Gulak against Braun Strowman. We had, the f we also had a uh, Firefly Funhouse segment involving, uh, Vince McMahon, we opened the segment with this. Uh, sorry to not bring it up earlier, but this is something which I did not care about the show. Uh, we had Vince McMahon being like, uh, just to make sure there's no uh, collision in the ring. We're going to make, uh, you got to uh, let them sign the contracts separately. I guess it's something different other than the predictability. I'm going to beat you at the Rumble. Um, you, um, you think I'm going to get you for jumping me? Yeah, that's how predictable it's going to be. So I guess this was completely different, because at least we get different interactions. So, Bray was signing in the Firefly Funhouse segment, going over their match, celebrating and, uh, going, uh, celebrating that he won the Universal title for the second time, until, she, uh, I forgot what his name is, I don't care. Came around in the post office, referencing, of course, Mr. Rogers, and uh, Bray signed, even though it's like, uh, The Fiend is supposed to sign that. Sure. Yeah, he does it. There was also Braun Strowman that suits into the next segment of the next match. Drew Gulak, after what happened last week, comes around, finally trying to actually feel like a badass. The steel chair does no effect on him. And it complete, and he completely loses. After the job, the squash match, it then off some manhandling. Uh, uh, why does he have to do this flip stuff uh, against a midget? Drew Gulak got signed for nothing. If he's gonna be doing the same segments, where's the character change? What what makes him more compelling to cape on SmackDown? Other than Drake Maverick, that's still on NXT for some apparent reason. At least fans can get behind Drake Maverick because he has a certain personality. And he has a certain motif of being an underdog that people can get behind because he's animated and he has interesting, and he ha and he's always fun. There's nothing interesting about Drew Gulak because he's just a technical wrestler, and that's apparently it. He wears no knee pads. He comes. He looks like he's from Philadelphia because of the the tights he wears, and he just comes around just getting power slammed anyway. After that, he signs the contract. And of course, most of them are just begging for Roman Reigns and stuff. We also had. Another squash match. Kalisto against Cesaro. It ended up, of course, Kalisto saying my bad from last week, losing my temper. Bloody, bloody, blah, blah, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. Then it ended up with Nakamura and Cesaro attacking uh, Sagrada Madalik and Lince Dorado. But not Kalisto. He lost anyway. There is no essential point to the match except probably breaking up uh, Lucha House Party. Because they're a jobber faction, the tag division was already a joke. The match was decent enough with some Hurricane Aranas, some some amazing European uppercuts. It would feel so good if some of the matches with Cesaro against a, 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 anybody from the Lucha House Party being so formulaic. The the match ended up again with a uh, uh, Snow Salida del Sol. Kalisto ended up losing. I think the neutralizer finished him off. Other than that, that was the match. Kalisto lost. And again, some arguments ensued, shoving him off. Kalisto came walking off when still they were butting heads with Grand Metal League this time. That's the segment. I don't know why WWE is trying to concern themselves with some conflict going on with the Lucha House Party. It's like watching the Matadors back back when it was just Epico and Primo with a, with a tiny midget arguing. At least... El Torito had some fanfare. There's nothing interesting about these three jobbers. And Kalisto should have been just a singles competitor in the first place. Or at least called a group of Lucha Dragons for some semblance of the team's supposed to be exciting. And Luchador style and stuff. They come around still jobbing out the guys that are more actually 
appealing and more exciting than them. And, Graham, and, and it's sad too because Kalisto is legitimately a former U.S. champion. I know the U.S. title doesn't mean crap, but at least it's supposed to bring some semblance of this story as actually supposed to be threatening. He's not. Next up, we had Sheamus, John Morrison, and The Miz. And this had to come over conflict with uh, The Miz and Biggie Langston because, because Miz is doubting his singles run. And Biggie is being like, what, 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 what would we do? What? I don't care about the conflict with two irrelevant mid carters. I want to see if Biggie can actually be a more legitimate thing, but if he still is dealing with that positivity crap, and he's not going to be treated like how he was previously, because he was treated as this big power lifter. Big, silent, and athletic, and he had aspirations of making it big in the WWE. I supported that. As soon as the New Day came, all they clashed with was just sticking with the same positivity crap. Twerking, looking like they're molesting children using cereal, and it just looked so bad. I did not like it. And it made me f feel like, can we have any competent black wrestlers on WWE? And it's like, we have that with, with the Hurt Business, but we don't have that on SmackDown. So we had a six-man tag because the Heavy Machinery have an issue with Miz and Morrison. And Sheamus has an issue with Big, with Big E. He came out of nowhere after Big E was talking trash to not be on Miz TV. And we just have, that's our main event. That's our main event. That's our main event. That's a bottom-tier mid-card match. Being our six-man tag main event. Someone, please help me. Okay. And the strategy with Miz and Morrison was just get them all out of the ring. Tell me why people like the Miz. Tell me, please. It ended up with uh, some shoulder tackles. That, su that stupid little running spear that he does off the mid ropes. Double caterpillar. Drop kicks outside, and you think, okay, a relevant match, probably Retribution will send a message against the top stars on SmackDown. No, they don't. They just finished the match off a big ending over Miz. Sheamus didn't cooperate well with Miz and Morrison. He came walking off anyway, so they already had the numbers, numbers problem. Uh, the storytelling was just that Sheamus doesn't get along with anybody, even though he has a, a, a vendetta with, with Big E after beating him clean. And, uh... That's about it. Baby faces stay on top. The best segment for me that I popped was literally just Paul Heyman coming back. Actually managing a guy with the, uh, the top guy with the biggest reaction power in the top in the in the Fed. So it's good to see Paul Heyman back managing. He had a creative he had a creative uh, position on Raw. And he was recently addressed to be fired at that point. They already fired the head writer of SmackDown for a new one. Get rid of your head writers, please. Other than that, the match was planned. Every match was planned. The build was so minimalistic. We had Roman Reigns coming around at least saying that he'll be on payback. I will, be, I will come back and just wreck and leave. I will win back a universal title that I didn't lose in the first place. And, and that's not just a prediction, it's a spoiler. And then Paul Heyman comes around saying, you believe that. And it would kind of make sense that he's with Paul Heyman, because it looks like Paul Heyman, always when he was feuding with Brock Lesnar, he always had Roman Reigns in a high regard. So you can always put that in the factor, why he's managing him in the first place. And we don't have to hear Roman Reigns speak. And over the legitimacy of Roman Reigns already already accomplished, we have our new top heel on SmackDown. Thanks, Corbin isn't really doing much. No one cares about Bray Wyatt and his corny little stick tongue out thing and his uh, little little triangle with uh, Strowman and Alexa. Alexa came around just tossing a mug, and Nikki just compares that to the theme when she had her hair twisted. If teasing that it looks like Alexa's getting crazy enough to be with the fiend, and nothing's concerning me with that. Tamina came from like a monster when she returned back. To being an absolute jobber baby face like she did just a year ago. So, no, I think she was a heel with Nia Jax, but I don't care. That was about it. That was all the women's division had to offer. Terrible promos and a teaser for something I'm not impressed for. So, literally, if you want to watch SmackDown, just watch it because of the Paul Heyman segment. 
That's about it. Is there any high factor going into payback? Just a triple threat match. Just to see just Roman Reigns just in a different attitude. Probably some tables breaking. The match probably will be fun because Roman Reigns is literally more enticing to watch in Braun Strowman that he's just going to break one thing and probably ram something through. Bray Wyatt White sticking his tongue out and no selling. That's at least something. That's at least a heavyweight main event. Keith Lee versus Randy Orton might be entertaining. I have no enticement for the rest of the card. It just feels so bland to me. Other than that, that's the most they can build up in like in seven days. Wrestling and otaku get a life, lose weight. Please, just do something except YouTube. Change your name. I'm begging you. This is depressing. If you don't think Roman Reigns is a top draw on Raw, I would not ask you what do you think is the best. To what do you think is the top draw on WWE? Because it's not Roman Reigns. It's nobody else unless you're counting Brock Lesnar or Edge. <clears throat> or Randy Orton. It's nobody else that's a newer wrestler except Roman Reigns that's a top draw. No one cares about Drew McIntyre. Other than he looks like a top star, he's bland. I never discredited his wrestling matches. He has good matches. He's just increasingly bland. And Seth Rollins just lost any sort of interest with me since like 2016. But uh, that's uh, the SmackDown review. Hopefully you guys, hopefully, I'm really begging. Hopefully payback goes well. But that's the cover for me. Hopefully you liked the review. Thanks for watching. Try to subscribe and help my channel up. When I get up to 30, as quick as possible. But that's the cover for me.